Hey, Scott Cook here, and we got another Kerbal uh, Interstellar Space Program episode. This time I'm going to be looking at reactors. And I'm going to conveniently ignore the fact that my uh, ship crashed into the planet using the Albert Drive, because, yeah, like I said, i got to figure that out a little bit more. So anyways, we're going to get started. First thing I'm going to do is launch some exotic fuels into space so that we can meet up with my uh, nuclear generating reactor. Now these are canisters of uranium tetrafluoride and thorium tetrafluoride. And we're going to basically have to deliver those to my uh, nuclear array so that we can start uh, taking advantage of them. Now, these canisters are deceptively heavy. That whole cradle probably weighs about 25 tons. Those fuels are extremely heavy, so they require a bit of a strong boost to get them out into orbit. But uh, aside from that, it's a pretty standard launch. We're just going to go ahead here and... Um, move on now the plan is I'm gonna get these into orbit and then that little space tug that I have at the space station is gonna pick them up and haul them out to uh, the reactor as you can see here I'm just checking a few things uh, just kinda of making sure everything you see we started to consume some fuel and things like that so we have to make sure that those don't run out otherwise the space station will become dead filling up some fuel I'm gonna decouple here in an effort to try to get ahead of things, I'm going to speed ahead here shortly to when I actually rendezvous with the tank. Um, from there, it's going to create a larger orbit and go meet up with the nuclear generator. We'll get out there, we'll start uh, doing some maintenance on it, because I don't know if you noticed, but my generator has started to create actinides, which are basically waste radioactive products that have to be reprocessed. Otherwise, they build up in the reactor, they affect its efficiency, and uh, ultimately will shut it down. So we don't want that. Now, this is only one part of the whole process. I need to get fresh fuel up there. And there's another reason why I need to carry these tanks out there is they also have storage for what's known as depleted materials. Now, when you reprocess the actinides in a nuclear reactor, you get, you get about 80% of the fissionable product back, meaning you'll get 80% of uranium or thorium that will go back into it. Uh, but you will end up with some depleted products and you need a place to put those depleted products or you cannot begin the reprocessing um, procedure. Now the other half of this is we're going to need a science lab on that station so I built another ship for that but we'll come in. Right now we're just meeting up with this and uh, pretty standard docking procedure. This episode didn't get too long which is good. I'm trying to find, keep them as short so that they're you know straight to the point and they're not long drawn out affairs that people have to go back and forth through looking for the information they want. Again using that uh, docking port alignment tool from Navy Fish which is incredibly useful. I just wish I could do these more on the light side but unfortunately I always end up doing all these maneuvers on the dark side. So we're coming in here. Uh, I'm going at 4x normal speed as well because I mean if you want uh, information on how to do docking and maneuvers and stuff like that there's tons of tutorials out there and I can recommend a few if you're interested. Uh, I want to get to the juicy parts of the KSP Interstellar pack. However, I'm also coming up on a point in my series here where I might have to stop uh, looking right at the Interstellar pack and start bringing in some other mods to kind of finish out my space um, space program here because I'm going to have to start dealing with conventional uh, rockets still. And that's the one thing about this mod that I really enjoy is the fact that it doesn't make good old-fashioned rockets obsolete and useless. A lot of conventional old rockets from other parts and standard uh, KSP still have a purpose and they still work out. As you can see here, I'm using the push-pull engines to generate my um, my uh, velocity so that I can match orbits with the uh, nuclear generator here. Now, if you notice, um, I'm getting glow on fuel. And that's because I didn't calculate the delta V requirements properly for how heavy a load this was. And I ended up running out of fuel at the last minute. Fortunately for me, little Jebediah was flying. He's just like, screw that. We can make this. So, uh, I mean, I did have enough fuel in this thing to get the orbit almost circularized to my target. And I had plenty of RCS thrusters uh, fuel. So, I was able to try to catch it with RCS. I was going to see if I could do it. And luckily, I pulled it off. We ended up getting uh, there, just skipping ahead. Uh, burned most of my RCS, but I had enough to actually rendezvous with the nuclear reactor. So, unfortunately, I'm going to have to abandon this vehicle here for 
once we finish delivering the mission. And I got another vehicle coming that can take Jebediah and uh, I think it's Bill home. But uh, for now, we're just going to come in and deliver all of this nuclear fissionable material. Now, once we get started, uh, once the del delivery's finished, I'm going to send up the maintenance vehicle. Because in order to reprocess some of the waste material out of a any of the f nuclear reactors in this uh, mod, you need a you need either a refinery or a science lab. Both of those devices will do it. And the other thing you got to do is um, you got to have a space, like uh, an empty place, to put the uh, depleted materials once they're finished. So you can even see here when I'm coming in for a docking maneuver that how much that tank just wants to get squirrely on me because it's so heavy all right yeah I'm coming in nice and straight and nice and good and there's the docking port right there on the electric generator and boom we made it so Jeb and Bill will just kind of hang out here as you can see from some of these things uh, I've got some waste materials and my uranium's getting low but they're about down to half so we're gonna do some maintenance all right this is the uh, maintenance vehicle I made it's basically a science lab with a rocket engine there's not too much more to it. Uh, it does have um, several hexagonal tanks, including tanks that carry uh, lithium, as well as a tank that uh, is a derillium and tritium tank, which carries those two products. And it's also on the sides got helium-3 tanks. Now, I'm going to use this to deliver the last little bit of material I need to get to, uh, to the generator. Basically, in order to create tritium, you have to enable tritium breeding on the reactor. In order to do that, it needs a fuel supply of lithium. So lithium is needed to create tritium and derillium. Uh, in order to get that, you have to actually use a science lab and a body of water that I've found so far. But I'll get into more of that a little bit later. I'm actually thinking for this particular topic, I'm gonna to do a two-parter, simply because there's a lot to cover and I need to kill some time in between. Because in order to develop some of these products, it takes time, obviously. Um, for example, to create helium-3, which is uh, one of the fuel sources you can use in some engines and some uh, uh, fission reactors, is you have to decay tritium. Now, in order to decay tritium, you basically need to produce it because you can't get tritium unless it's within certain reactors or engines. So what you do to get helium-3 if you take tritium or you take lithium to a nuclear reactor, breed tritium out of it, and then let that tritium decay into uh, helium three. And I'm going to need some helium three for my future projects here because I want to take advantage of the fact that a fission reactor, um, the ones that uh, this vehicle is using, uh, can use helium three to make. 100% of their output charged particles. Now if you remember from the last episode I was talking about the difference between heat energy and charged particles in the fission reactors, it's that the um, excuse me, fusion reactors <laughs> uh, is basically because helium-3 when used as a fuel source in those reactors, the uh, uh, fusion reactors, it, um, it, it all of that reactors output then becomes charged particles. 100%. You can also do a helium derillium blend of the fuel products. That's one fuel mode that can have. And in that case, I think it delivers about 20% heat energy and 80% charged particles. Now, you may be asking, well, what's the huge advantage? To answer that, all you got to do is if you're, if you're developing one product from your uh, fusion reactors, if you're developing charged particles, and you set your generators to take advantage of that, putting them into direct conversion mode, then you're getting the most efficient electrical generation out of a reactor that is currently possible in this mod. Uh, pound for pound, mind you. Uh, bigger generators may still probably develop more power, but you're still losing a lot of power through inefficiency and things like that. So in order to get the best electrical charge, especially out of a fusion engine, uh, is to run it on pure helium-3, with the electrical generator attached that's set to direct conversion mode and then you'll, you're basically getting the most efficient setup that you can do with that particular one. Now you got to remember that fusion reactors also 
based on their makeup, tend to be what I find the most useful. The, the widely most, the ones that I use in a lot of my applications, especially with regards to thrust and g electrical generation. The other two have their place, but uh, like I said, the, the old nuclear types, the big green tanks, are heavy bastards and they don't produce quite as much po uh, power, like pound for pound, but they last longer, their fuel lasts longer. Whereas antimatter delivers the most energy, but you have to collect the resource. So I'm just EVAing my Kerbals out of there and putting two of them in the science lab so they can start reprocessing the nuclear uh, products or the nuclear waste products. And then I've got this guy coming out here. In order to, sh to change fuels in a nuclear reactor, you have to shut it down first. In order to shut down a nuclear reactor, it requires an EVA. Your Kerbal basically has to face plant it before you get the option to shut down the reactor. Then you've got to give it time to cool down. It takes, it still generates power until the radioactivity of the products already in there decay. And then you can, once that's done and it's cool, then you can start changing, or you can change the fuel sources and add more and whatnot. But we'll get more into that in a little bit here. Now this is a design for a probe that I'm using, and it's just kind of to, I just kind of threw it together because I wanted to show you guys how to take advantage of uh, plasma thrusters. Now I haven't really talked about them because unfortunately I don't really have a huge need for them right now. Conventional are still a little bit more useful. But I wanted to throw this together just to show you off here now, the advantage of a plasma engine. So right now the only thing that it's got on it is a small tank of monopropellant and I'm uh, taking power from my microwave relay network. And I've also got a very tiny fusion, uh, fusion reactor with uh, two generators on here, the uh, 62.5 size. And you can see here this probe has enough power in just that to launch itself off of the platform and I can get it into orbit all on one tiny 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 fuel of monopropellant. Now the other advantage of a plasma engine is that once you are out in vacuum you can set it to uh, uh, quantum vacuum mode at which point it no longer needs fuel it just needs electrical power to run. So it's incredibly useful for that. They're great for small craft but they do come up they do get up to the 2.5 size in the game and the 1.25 size. Uh, they are kind of finicky to play with. Like, I still kind of advanced. you got to make sure you know exactly where your relays are or be able to turn your dishes somehow or have enough dishes to face in every general direction. As you can see here, I'm trying to, I've am trying got a very steep uh, inclination in my gravity turn simply because if I turn the probe too much from here, it'll lose power and then therefore lose the thrust it needs to get out, of, uh, out into orbit. But as you can see here, I'm going for the changing it to the quantum vacuum. And uh, as soon as I get above 70, I can fire it up again, and it no longer consumes fuel. I have an idea to try to use these in the future. Uh, again, I just wanted to introduce these to you guys here now so you can get an idea of what the advantage is. And keep in mind that this is a sandbox game, so er I'm getting the most advanced of all the technology to kind of show you how to use it. And there's one other thing here is this uh, spectrometer I've got here showing you where uranium and thorium deposits are on the planet. And we can use that for resource collection, which I'm going to get a little bit more into here shortly. So that's what I got for you right now. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a little something about how to use this. And um, this is Scott Cook saying thanks for watching. See you in the verse. Have a great time. Talk to you soon. Bye.